For centuries, starting from Greek philosophers before Christ, this was considered an earthly motion. And this was considered a heavenly motion. The earthly motions were considered messy and changeable, and the celestial motions were considered perfect and eternal. The philosophers saw it as a profound division of realms, one governed by the unpredictable chaos of nature, the other by the perfection of the heavens. For centuries after the Greek philosophers, people thought a falling apple and the moon's motion were completely different things. But Isaac Newton had a revolutionary idea. What if the same force that makes the apple fall also makes the moon orbit the earth? He proposed that both are caused by a single, universal force called gravity. On Earth, this pull makes objects like apples fall straight down. But for objects like the moon, which are farther away and moving sideways very fast, gravity doesn't pull them straight down. Instead, it bends its path into a curve, causing the moon to fall around the Earth, creating an orbit. So, what happened in this unification? Two events that looked different are now explained by a single equation. This was one of the first great unifications in physics, but ever since, there have been many other unifications. James Clerk Maxwell unified electricity, magnetism, and light into a single theory of electromagnetism, showing that light is an electromagnetic wave. Albert Einstein unified space and time into a four-dimensional fabric called space-time. And later, he connected gravity with the curvature of this space-time in his theory of general relativity. The electroweak theory, developed by Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg, showed that the electromagnetic force and the weak force are actually two aspects of a single force at high energies. Physicists have also pursued a grand unified theory that combines the strong force with the electroweak force. The most ambitious goal of all is the search for a theory of everything, which would unify all four fundamental forces, including gravity, under one comprehensive framework. But unlike the rest of the examples, this last one is still underway. But what do we actually mean when we say two theories or domains are unified? Let me explain this through the history of a set of important unifications in physics. The story begins with Thales, an ancient Greek philosopher who was one of the first known to observe the effects of static electricity. He noticed that rubbing amber with cloth could attract small objects like feathers, an early observation of what we now call static electricity. Many people like William Gilbert and Benjamin Franklin contributed to the concept of electricity. But it wasn't until the 18th century that Coulomb formulated Coulomb's law, which describes the force between two charged particles, laying the groundwork for the quantitative study of electricity. Magnetism, viewed as a totally different subject than electricity, developed in parallel to electricity. The story of magnetism started before Christ by discovering magnetic stones. Many people contributed to developing the concepts of magnetism until Hans Orsted discovered the connection between electricity and magnetism in 1820. He noticed that a current carrying wire caused a nearby compass needle to deflect, the first demonstration that electric currents produce magnetic fields. Ampere built on Orsted's discovery and developed Ampere's law, which describes the relationship between electric current and the magnetic field it produces. In 1831, Faraday discovered electromagnetic induction, showing that a changing magnetic field could induce an electric current. Filling a significant gap in this unification, Finally, in the 19th century, Maxwell observed that all the formulations of magnetism and electricity could be unified into his famous set of four Maxwell's equations. In doing that, he also discovered a missing link enforced by mathematical consistency that was later verified by experiments. Maxwell's equations showed that light is an electromagnetic wave and provided the complete theoretical foundation for electromagnetism as we know it today. Einstein deeply influenced by a property in Maxwell's equations, developed his special theory of relativity in 1905. The key insight came from the realization that the speed of light, as predicted by Maxwell's equations, is constant and independent of the motion of the source or the observer. This contradicted the prevailing Newtonian notion that velocities should be additive. To resolve this inconsistency, Einstein proposed that space and time are not absolute but are instead relative and interwoven into a single continuum known as space-time.
Let me pause this unification story for a moment. The process of unifying fundamental concepts in physics has consistently led to groundbreaking discoveries throughout history. Every major unification has not only simplified our understanding of nature, but also revealed previously hidden phenomena that were inaccessible to older frameworks. It almost feels as though nature plays the unification game. And if we wish to uncover the reality, we must learn to play its game. One of the most exciting frontiers in this quest for unification is the connection between machine learning and physics. They both aim to extract patterns from vast datasets that nature generates, and the boundaries that we humans draw as physics and or as machine learning are just human conventions that nature doesn't need to respect. Therefore, finding a unifying framework between machine learning and physics could unlock entirely new levels of insight. Okay, back to the unification story. Later in the 20th century, Hermann Minkowski reformulated Maxwell's equations using the language of special relativity of Albert Einstein. He showed that the four Maxwell's equations can be reorganized into this compact form. And this is the start of a new set of unifications in modern physics. And you can already see an interesting feedback loop so far. Maxwell's work guided Einstein to develop his theory of relativity. And Einstein's work led Minkowski to reformulate Maxwell's equations into a modern four-dimensional form. In this modern format, F is named the Faraday tensor, which is defined as the derivatives of a four-dimensional potential vector A. People soon realize that the physics described by Maxwell's equations remains invariant under the following transformation of A. That means if we replace A with the one on the right-hand side of the arrow, the Maxwell equations don't change. This is called an invariance. Now keep this invariance in mind as it plays an important role in another unification in physics, quantum electrodynamics. By the time the modern look of Maxwell's equations was written down by Minkowski, another field in physics started to emerge, quantum mechanics. In the early 20th century, a series of experiments revealed that light did not behave like a continuous wave, as Maxwell's equations suggested. Instead, light was found to be quantized. In 1924, Louis de Broglie, as part of his groundbreaking doctoral thesis, proposed that not only photons the particles of light, but also electrons exhibit both particle-like and wave-like behavior. Something we know as the concept of wave-particle duality. Later, in 1926, Erwin Schrödinger quantified this concept by developing the famous Schrödinger equation, a partial differential equation that describes how the wave function of a particle, like an electron, evolves with time. At this point, another unification started in physics. Paul Dirac took quantum mechanics a step further by incorporating the principles of Einstein's special relativity into the theory. Dirac sought a relativistic version of the Schrödinger equation and discovered the famous Dirac equation. Next was the turn for unifying Maxwell's electromagnetic field and quantum mechanics. People like Paul Dirac, Werner Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, and Enrico Fermi are the key figures in the early attempts at quantum electrodynamics. These physicists sought to combine Maxwell's equations with the Dirac equation. But the real breakthrough in quantum electrodynamics came after World War II. Richard Feynman, Julian Schwinger, and Sin Itiro Tomonega independently developed the modern theory of quantum electrodynamics, a consistent mathematical framework to handle interactions between electrons, positrons, and photons. They shared the 1965 Nobel Prize in Physics for their work. As was mentioned earlier in the video, the Maxwell equations do not change if we replace A with the following. In other words, the equations are invariant under this transformation. On the other hand, physicists soon realize that the newly born quantum electrodynamics is also invariant under this same transformation if the wave equation of particles like electrons is changed simultaneously with the change in the vector potential A in the following form. Surprisingly, this is just a position-dependent U1 transformation as defined in group theory. By the 1940s, 
Quantum electrodynamics, QED, based on a U1 gauge symmetry, was considered a great success. Its predictions agreed with experiments to an astonishing degree of accuracy, up to 10 decimal places in some cases. It was around that time that Chen Ning Yang and Robert Mills asked a central question. Can we generalize the idea of gauge symmetry from U1 to other groups like SU2 and SU3 in group theory? Later in 1954, Yang and Mills published their landmark paper titled Conservation of Isotopic Spin and Isotopic Gauge Invariance. What we now know as the Yang-Mills theory eventually became a cornerstone of modern particle physics. The work of Yang and Mills led to the further unification of forces in physics. In 1930, to explain the missing energy problem in the decay of a neutron atom, Wolfgang Pauli predicted the existence of a mysterious particle, later called the neutrino. People soon realized that this particle couldn't be explained by quantum electrodynamics, and there was a need for a separate theory to explain neutrinos. In 1934, Enrico Fermi developed the first theoretical framework for the weak force, known as the Fermi theory of weak interactions that explains neutrinos. Initially, the electromagnetic force and the weak force seemed unrelated. The electromagnetic force acted at long range, while the weak force acted only at extremely short distances. In 1961, following the groundbreaking work of Yang and Mills, Sheldon Glashow proposed that the weak force and electromagnetism could be described by the Yang-Mills theory that is invariant under a combination of U1 and SU2 groups. But Glashow's work had a problem that was later solved by Abdus Salam and Steven Weinberg. Besides the electromagnetic and weak forces, there is a third force that is currently explained by the same Yang-Mills theory that this time is invariant under the SU3 group. Now, remember the four-dimensional form of the Maxwell equations proposed by Minkowski? Today, after centuries of development, the electric, magnetic, weak, and strong forces are all described by equations that have the same form. Here D is a sort of derivative, and J is an external current. Now let me surprise you with another unexpected unification in physics. In 1948, Richard Feynman, who is also credited for developing quantum electrodynamics, introduced a completely new way of thinking about quantum mechanics. Instead of imagining particles as moving along a single, well-defined path, Feynman proposed that particles actually follow all possible paths at once. This method became the standard approach in particle physics. And in the path integral formalism, this equation, describing all the forces of particle physics, can be derived from the following sum over all the configurations of fields. Each configuration is weighted by a probability distribution of the following form. Here F in the probability and the field equation are the same strength tensor. What surprises us is that statistical mechanics, which started in the 1870s by Ludwig Boltzmann, to describe the behavior of large collections of particles, like atoms and molecules, in terms of probabilistic distributions of energy, momentum, and position, can also be reformulated into a closely similar path integral formalism. Originally, Boltzmann's approach focused on the idea that the macroscopic properties of a system, like temperature and entropy, emerge from the collective behavior of microscopic particles following probabilistic rules. However, with the development of modern quantum field theory, it was discovered that by changing real time to an imaginary time, the quantum path integral, which sums over all possible particle trajectories, transforms into a form that looks just like the partition function used in statistical mechanics. This deep connection allows physicists to use the same mathematical tools to study quantum fluctuations in particle physics and thermal fluctuations in statistical systems. It kind of unifies the formalisms of particle physics and thermodynamics. Now the question is, can we reformulate a machine learning problem into the same path integral formalism that unifies particle physics and statistical physics? For that, we need to reformulate a given machine learning problem into a probability distribution of the same form as in physics. Can we really do that? 
So far in a series of videos on this channel, we have discussed how to reformulate a linear regression, a logistic regression, and a deep neural network into this same formalism. But all these take their own assumptions, which do not apply to all possible datasets. So is there a general way to explain any dataset by a padding error formalism, regardless of its conditions or the system it is collected from? Before answering that, let's discuss a few points. One of the important concepts in statistical mechanics is the equilibrium state. According to the second law of thermodynamics, any isolated system moves toward a state that maximizes its entropy. And since there is no other configuration with a higher entropy, the system will stay there forever. This means that its probability distribution will not evolve with time anymore. The concept that a system evolves to its maximum entropy is shared between physics and machine learning, in the former by the second law of thermodynamics and in the latter by the maximum entropy principle of information theory. In fact, in machine learning, unlike in physics, we can only be predictive when the system has evolved into its maximum entropy state and settled there. Otherwise, the probability distribution at the data collection time is not the same as the probability distribution at the prediction time. Now, as far as our spreadsheet data is collected from a system that is in its equilibrium state, it is governed by a static probability distribution. The problem is, unlike in physics, where we go from bottom up and derive the form of the probability distribution, in machine learning, the true form of the probability distribution for a given dataset is not known. There are non-parametric methods that are developed to infer the unknown probability distribution of a system directly from the data collected from it. These methods do not assume a specific functional form for the underlying probability distribution and instead let the data determine its shape. One widely used method of this type is the kernel density estimation or KDE. The concept was first introduced by Emmanuel Parzen in 1962 in his influential paper on estimation of a probability density function and mode. In this paper, Parzen introduced the method of using kernel functions to estimate probability density functions from a set of samples, which is now widely known as the Parzen-Rosenblatt window method. In this method, an analytic probability distribution of the following form is constructed from a dataset. Here, the sum is over each row of the dataset, and k is the kernel, which is an analytic function. If we have a large dataset, the form of this kernel becomes somewhat irrelevant but the most common choice is the Gaussian kernel. The kernel density method is by now well integrated into most machine learning libraries and can be accessed through a few lines of code. Now, since the exponential of the logarithm of a function is equal to itself, we can transform this probability into the same form as in the path integral formalism in a statistical physics. From here on, we cannot tell if we are working on a machine learning problem, or on a statistical physics problem by just looking at the mathematics. And just like in the unification of particle physics and a statistical physics using the path integral formalism, we can now use the path integral technology to analyze any dataset in machine learning. The importance of this KDE method is turning a bunch of numbers in a dataset into an analytic form, whose variables are the columns of our spreadsheet that we can integrate or take derivatives of, just like the probabilities in physics that are analytic. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.